Good afternoon, AI fans, and welcome back to beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. We're here midway through day two of three days of coverage of Dell Tech World. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined by Dave Vellante. I feel smarter than I did when I woke up this morning. What about you? Yeah, well, we had the dual, at least dual master class this morning. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. dual or tri master class. Yes, yeah, seriously. Uh, we're going to go seriously. deeper now. And, and, no, and, and now we're going to take it one step further with our next guest, Jeff Clark. The, you, you're, you, know, you have 17 jobs at Dell. <laughs> I, when we were talking, I, I was going to introduce you just by your title right now, but you literally gave us you know, four different roles. You're basically playing internally. You were the keynote this morning, huge room full of people listening to you drop serious knowledge about data, about AI, about everything. Can you give us a little recap? It was a fun morning. <laughs> yes, it was. Big morning for Dell. We talked about the AI factory its role, our role, how we're delivering AI for our customers, and ultimately, how do we accelerate the adoption? How do we make it easy? And we spent a whole lot of time talking about how to take this tremendous, I think, groundbreaking technology that is so disruptive, game-changing, changing the basis of competition, and in enabling our customers. Because quite frankly, if you're not doing it, it's going to be done to you and it's going to change the basis of competition, again, as I mentioned, and we had some fun with that today. So I threw out a few things that I think are important, sort of five things that we believe in to help accelerate the adoption of AI, one of those being the data. Mm -hmm. The data is the differentiator, 83% of the data is on-prem, 50% of it's created on the edge, and because of that, we believe AI goes to the data because it's more efficient, more effective, more secure. We believe that there is no one size fits all, so it's going to be a wide range of implementation out on the edge, out on the PC, in a department, in a data center, combined, combined data centers. And then I talked about two versions of open, an open modular architecture, so you can take advantage of the rapid development and advancements, I think about a year ago where we were and where we are today and what's coming, oh my gosh. And then the last component that we believe in that drives the foundation of AI is an open and broad ecosystem. Because it's equally advancing. You um, Super critical. You likened the, the AI wave. You said we haven't seen anything this big since, and you, I know you love trains, since the Industrial Revolution, <laughs> right? steam power, the, the societal effects of folks moving, you know, the agrarian society moving to the city. And I think, look, PCs were awesome, right? Made us all more productive, mobile, cloud, big data, but, but nothing like what you're projecting here. How do you think, what do you think of the societal impacts? Are we all going to move back to the country? Are we going to move in space? Are we going to start flying? <laughs> Very hard to predict. Well, I, I, I don't think when people move from farms, move to cities, began to work in factories, and we had the massive modernization that was associated with the Industrial Revolution, we knew where we were going. And we reflect back on it as historians, and we can see it had these profound impacts, culturally social impact, or social economic impact, in a variety of other ways. What, what I can tell you, at least our experience inside Dell and working with our customers, what we're finding is it takes our most valuable resources and gives them more time to do more valuable work. Mm -hmm. It allows people to do, rather than what we call inside at least our company, some of this connective tissue work to kind of make it work, that now is streamlined because you've simplified, standardized, automated those basics go away of people having to do the task and you can apply intelligence, gain knowledge, and then drive more value added work. So maybe that's a way of saying, which I really believe, we will all do greater value work in time, have a greater impact in time, and then for us, again, I think about having our developers have more time to develop. Yes. Be more efficient at develop. Think about the productivity gains that we can have with our large R&D footprint mm -hmm. and our ability to develop more things faster, higher quality. 
I get excited about that being Absolutely. a former developer. It's only, I, I, it always shocks me every time this stat comes up, it's only 27% of a developer's day that's spent actually creating, or their week, their work week. If we got 73 more percent creative time, or even 50% more creative time, imagine what we can create. World's our oyster. Top decile uh, software companies have roughly 60% of an engineer's developer's time coding, architecting, thinking about how to code. That's the gold standard to get everybody to. And once you get to 60, why not 80, why not 90, why not more, right? Yeah, absolutely. Think about the, the potential, the, the latent potential that is tied up in the nonsense that we've created and the human potential that could be gained in making them more productive. Think about our sellers the same way. Our sellers don't spend enough time selling. How do we get them selling it more often? Let's inform them better. Let's bridge the marketing data and the selling data to help inform with our customers how to best meet their needs. The possibilities are endless almost. Your, your conversation with Charlie Kawas was, was really quite interesting and enlightening. I mean, they yeah. Broadcom made a bet that a long time ago we're going to connect all these you know, NP, a, a GPUs and CPUs, XPUs together. It's a trend that obviously you guys, you got Intel, you got AMD, you got Nvidia, you got ARM-based stuff, you got, you know, others, RISC-V, right? You're Welcome. sort of agnostic to all this, mm -hmm. and then you double down on the ones that are going to serve your customers best in the moment. We're open, Dave. But, yeah, you're open. But, yeah, yes, you always have been, right? Yes, sir. But so I'm trying to figure out, like, is what you're doing in, in GPUs with NVIDIA, is it just sort of another opportunistic move or is it something that has, has potentially the legs of, you know, Wintel back in the day? Um, well, how do you think uh, about that? I, I think about it in the following way. I tried to describe it this morning and hopefully I, I, I got this concept across. This is a different computing architecture. Yep. So Wintel, arguably, is the old traditional computing architecture, certainly is in reference to the data center this morning. And we're creating, and a new one has been created. And if you think about how it's being created, it's around what, I like Charlie's analogy around the human body, the GPUs, the brain, the networking's the heart. Storage. Onto me, storage is the yeah. lungs. Well done. Yeah, providing yeah. <laughs> the oxygen in. Yeah, yeah, the lungs. So would you Good expect job. anything less? <laughs> this analogy is really going for it this year. Well, but, but it's you, great. But no, if you good. pull that together, that's what we're building is an optimized system there. Notice we didn't talk about operating system, we didn't talk about virtualization, we talked nope. about data and getting data to the cognitive part, moving it in a very fast way, extracting it out of these storage subsystems. How do we deliver those workloads via containers? It is a new architecture that's being involved, evolving. And as we go from training to inference, it's going to evolve again. I, I use the word quantization today, which is essentially the world try, trying to make things much more efficient, whether it's absolute performance being efficient, and you think of things around going from int 16, int 8, int 4, you talk about going better memory utilization, floating point 16 to eight to four as well. You can really take these models and take this infinite data sets and put them into more finite defined data sets and you can retune the model, retrain it and get much more efficient. It's a different architecture. And you were, I, I loved when I was doing my homework for this show, Morgan Stanley calling you the best architecture for this, the best way to play in the AI ecosystem game when it comes to enterprise. When you're looking out at the room today, when you hear things like the market validating that, when you see your team performing at the level that they're performing right now, how does it make you feel? Oh, probably uh, mounting expectations. Yeah. We have, a lot, we have a lot to do to help our customers through this. I, I tend to sit back and look at what we haven't done versus what we have done. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a trait of our company, please but never satisfied. Might have heard that from my boss. And but never satisfied. Mm, I'm going to take we, that. We to the tend bank. to think about wh why we we believe we're uniquely positioned is the breadth of our portfolio. As I mentioned, we believe AI goes out to the edge. We're at the edge. We're a very very large commercial PC uh, provider to our customers. 
we're at the edge with an edge business, which I was on stage with you last year talking about our right. edge business, mm -hmm. native edge specifically. And then you talk about servers and storage and networking, then ultimately to professional services. And then I talked about the complexity of these, of these systems that we're building, the level of integration, speed of deployment, time to first token, time to value. Ah. What, a, what a playground that we can operate in and we think we have the, the breadth of skill and capability to do it. So you just had Doug Schmidt up here. I think, well, Doug's got, he's got a whole list of things for me to do in professional services so we can accomplish what our customers expect of us. So I think it's rising expectations. Yeah. It's how I would characterize it and we're going to rise to the occasion. I, I got to ask Jeff the, that. The, the PC question. We got, yeah, do my, it. I got my new XPS here and then you go I'm and- I'm liking those. Yeah, and yeah. Except, except you just announced yeah. the AI PC. And I'm like, well, I want one of those. So my question is, is, is www.dell.com, yeah. <laughs> XPS. I know, but I just got this one. So will, will hey, AI- A guy like you can have two. Okay, all right, well, fair <laughs> enough. I've got, right. will AI, and I could argue both sides of the equation, will it compress or elongate PC cycles? I could argue on the one hand, more power, so I might be able to keep it longer. On the other hand, I want the next one. You remember, we went from 286 to 386. We were buying PCs every two years because we had to have the latest and greatest. Love it, that was Love fun. It. So, what is your assumption here? I think it's too early to call. Okay. Uh, my, my belief is, if you look at that pattern that you and I have been around the block for a while of 286, I remember 286, 16, 20, yeah. Yeah. 386, 16, 20, Pentium and so on, that each incremental step in performance, you are more productive, you could do more things. There's no reason to believe with the horsepower that we're harnessing in these NPUs and looking at the measurement of what we launched earlier in the year with Meteor Lake, what we just launched with our uh, Qualcomm partnership and the five products we talked about yesterday and again mm -hmm. today, and what's to come, the leapfrogging, leapfrogging of performance is massive. So now we're going to unleash the ability to, you're going to have a personal assistant in front of you. That personal assistant's going to help you search, it's going to help you organize, it's going to help you do live caption, it's going to help you recall, it's going to help you create. Aren't you going to want more of that? Yeah, so the, the answer comes down to, if it makes us more productive, like that earlier cycle that you just described, you know, through Pentium. It always then, does. Then, then it's going to be a compression of the Otherwise cycle. we'll be in a replacement cycle. But if, if, if to your point, yeah. if there's true incremental value that can be delivered in the form yeah. of productivity or new skill or potential that we give uh, our workers, you're going to want to go drive that productivity improvement. I got to ask you another question. So a couple years ago, several years ago now, as part of Big Ears, we were just kind of thinking out of the box and pushing Dell to think about maybe designing your own ARM-based silicon, and you and I have talked about this, and you're like, yeah, mm, we got merchant silicon partners that are going to do a better job that, than we will at that. Having said that, all the cloud players are now doing their own silicon. That when you talk to them as to why, they say, because we need to lower our cost. Will the merchant silicon partners that you have be able to deliver that on a continuous basis from, to, to help you lower your cost to stay competitive, because everybody's talking about hybrid AI, AI on-prem, what, what are your thoughts on that in terms of what are you seeing mm. from the merchant silicon vendors and their ability to do nitro-like stuff or training or, or, or inference type silicon well, at you know, low cost? In many ways, Dave, we're entering, I think, a new era for the PC, That was since it was a PC question, which has predominantly been x86. Right. Mm -hmm. Not anymore as of yesterday, ARM just entered the equation for us with Qualcomm. Uh, I can't say exactly who's doing what, but there are more ARM processors coming that are targeted into the design point for the PC. So again, as a former designer, I'm going, I have more choice than I've ever had before, so I've been doing this for nearly four decades, and I go, let me get this. So I can begin to pick parts for performance per watt, absolute performance, price point, mixed environment, and I can find a piece of silicon for each one of those that are optimized. That sounds like a lot of fun. And do you think, comp what has competition taught us in our industry? Yeah. 
it, it create, lowers cost. Right. <laughs> it, it his, at least if history is any indicator of what's happening in the future, it will lower absolute cost for our customers. So this is interesting. So your, the argument would be that that optionality gives you options that you can take advantage of. That we haven't that had perhaps before. vertical integration may not give. It reminds yeah. me of Connor and Seagate. Some, you'll, you'll remember this. When Finus came out, it was like, hey, we're going to use you know, merchant heads and media and was able to get to market much quicker. Al would say, well, we're going to vertically integrate because it's better for margins. Um, obviously, not the perfect example, but for a period of time there in the PC world, that optionality conferred competitive advantage for, for quite some time. It created a lot of value. Well, look what we have around the Windows platform is an enablement vehicle, if you will, that, that drives tremendous innovation. The history of the PC space has been a rich, vibrant ecosystem. It's driven innovation, incremental features over the course of time. And now you're seeing that from a host CPU with addition now NPUs. These NPUs have to be tuned to the OS stack. Right. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to see tuning, we're going to see performance deltas back to, again, when we used to do this a long time ago, you could design something that was faster than someone's, someone else's, even if you started from the same building block. That opportunity to optimize, whether it's your distinct software, in our case what we do, or working with Microsoft and others, absolutely. I mean, I think this is, I don't know what the right characterization is, but it's a new wave of innovation that's going to hit the PC that we haven't seen. It's going to be a reason to love your PC again. And, and, and you're, going to, you're going to get 24 hour battery life, but then, right. you're going, but then that's not the end of the story. You're going to want more of that innovation. That's just scratching uh, the surface. Well, it's yeah. going to be one of the edge devices that brings that power into a lot more hands, which is a very exciting time for innovation across the board. For all it's of us. still the world's greatest productivity device and we're going to make it better. It is. Jeff, thank you so much for being here with us today in the middle of what is a very busy day for you. This has been fantastic. My pleasure. And Good insightful. Time. Dave, thank you as well. And thank all of you for tuning in wherever you might be enjoying our delicious three days of Dell Tech Week coverage here. Live on theCUBE, my name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE here in Las Vegas, Nevada. We're the leading source for enterprise tech news.